welcome back to part two of our Bengal voyage with Bapaditya Biswas. My, my question was on the quantity versus the quality dilemma, which is uh, from the outside, I look at you as a mass fashion brand. You've said that you've had quality checks regularly, but when you become so big and you kind of, uh, you know, have a store, you're selling online, you're selling through collaborations, you're, you're probably even wholesaling. How do you manage this balance between quantity and quality? I think over the years, what has happened, working continuously and with a system, you start fine fine tuning it. And of course, the um, number of people working in the team has also increased. Like earlier, it was probably four or five of us. Now, uh, only in Bailu, we have around 30 people working where, where uh i mean 50 percent of the strength is just involved in the in the quality control so every piece whatever comes from the village is still checked whereas when we take new weavers under our wing in even in the village earlier we started started working with one or three now we have almost two, i mean 1200 weavers so every of them also goes through that uh, training of quality control we tell them our specifications and we are very strict from day one you, you know so that part also we try and monitor and there are a lot of i mean rejections which happen over the time and even a new weaver who comes and joins us it takes time for them to get used to our strict i mean quality control checks and measures so that's something we, we do not compromise on number one number two in terms of uh, say balancing out uh, uh, the thing, uh, yeah, it is a d the dilemma at times because the uh, prices of the yarns go up a lot and fluctuate and everything, the labor charges, everything has, has gone up. And we also increase according to time, but accordingly, we also try and increase our, our price points uh, at the same time to balance out um, that effect. But I, as I said, end of the day, I think Rumi, when she does her pricing, she always, at the back of her mind, uh, I think that cons that uh, commitment always keeps working as to if, say, for instance, I've uh, put a certain uh, design on a loom. Now, a loom and a weave, I mean, a weave and print and embroidery, they differ here in a way. If, it, if it's a print or embroidery, you can do one piece. But yeah. on a, when you're putting a thing on a loom, there's a minimum quantity that has to be put and every piece is going to come out the same. So if you have gone wrong on something, that entire uh, thing, you cannot change anymore. So that risk factor is very, very high. So what Rumi does is when we particularly put in a certain amount of things, uh, in, uh, uh, design particularly in place, uh, I think it's her experience over the last 20 years that she, can, she knows how to evaluate. She knows whether this price point... So in some designs we make maybe a little more some design she maybe compromises on the price a little bit because she feels that when she looks at the piece when it comes to her on her table she feels that this will sell at i mean uh, price point and of course then there is a standard uh, formula where there is a the, our cost and then we put in our overheads and profit and i mean that is done but after that also she kind of kinds of kind of compromises where she feels that if I want to make 100 pieces of the same thing, what is the price point that I need to sell it at? So I know, you know, my wholesalers will be happy. My retail customers are going to be happy and I can go back and do work. So she kind of juggles and that's her jugglery. I don't understand that at all. I mean, I'm horrible at it. Bailu Sari is the USP of a Bailu Sari is it's, uh, it's that it's value for money. Like the design, there's a perfect marriage between the design and the price where the design is not, uh, you feel that, you know, it, it has been designed enough. Uh, there has been a lot of intricacies that has gone into it, thought, thought process. There is a thought process, I mean, behind, even if it's a simple Abhi Sari of 800 rupees, you can understand the thought process because when you open it, you'll be like, wow, you know, I've got, in this particular combination or the design or the sudden element of uh, uh, unique stripe suddenly in the in the middle which so we so that's how i think even in a design element the idea of 
weaving with pom poms or sequins to give that sudden uh, shock value to that product where you feel oh my god i've never seen this so then you are you agree to pay that price yeah so so our product that way is a complete marriage between a design thought process and the price making so it's not a standard pricing policy that we follow for uh, balance. Uh, mass market, I really uh, don't believe that we really do mass market because handlooms is not possible to do mass because, uh, and also if you really see that we have a wide segment of different kinds of sarees. So every segment takes its own time. Like say for instance, when we do a jamdani, it takes almost two weeks to three weeks time. Or when we are doing a heavy jacquard, complex jacquard weave, it takes around a week or two weeks time. Or when we are doing abir sari. It takes two days to weave one sari. So every sari, the price point, the design aspect uh, is dependent on also the time it takes. So when, although I work with 1200 handlooms, but 1200 handlooms, that the entire production doesn't come to me in one day because every design takes its own time. So that's how we balance. But what probably we do in the beginning of the year is we, according to the demand, we we study the last year's pattern of what we have sold and what we have not sold. And we take a call on how much of Abhi Saris we are going to weave or how much of Jamdanis we are going to do or how much of Jakhads. There's always a room for new development. Then I, what one thing I do is I don't develop for any collection or a season or anything. I just do whatever every day comes to my mind. Mm. So there's always something new which is actually being experimented on the loom. So there are certain looms which are kept for experiments where we keep on experimenting things. And then once it comes, then we put it into a production. So, you know, that we manage it that way. Uh, I mean, 12 hand, loom, hand looms is also a huge quantity yeah. to maintain. But, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, we do that. We manage it because we have various segments of sarees, right from 850 rupees to like 24,000 rupees. So we have various segments and so we kind of monitor it accordingly. Right. And, um, you know, when I was speaking to Meeraji last week uh, for the Maheshwaris and she was telling me that in Maheshwar, you know, uh, when, when they set a warp, uh, you know, you have to commit uh, to 50 uh, meters, sometimes they even ask for 100. And, you know, Gaurang, for example, works with 25, uh, sometimes as low as 25. And she was saying, you know, Bapa has told me in the past that, you know, sometimes it's a hundred uh, meters even. And, you know, when you, when the sarees, hundred sarees, yeah, hundred sarees, sorry. Hundred sarees, I mean, would be on 550 meters. Yes. Yeah, so do you have, you have warps, uh, looms which specify yeah, like that? Yeah, Abhi sarees are all hundred sarees because they produce it very fast. And when you set it on the loom, there are certain fixed costs. Yeah. Uh, loom costs. So in order to cover that cost and in order for me to give uh, you the Abhi Sari at 850 rupees, I need to divide that fixed cost into a certain number of Sari so that, you know, the cost doesn't go up. Right. So the more the quantity, I, I can divide it into as many Sari. So Abhi Sari, we do around 100 Sari per warp. Uh, okay. Then, so obviously our price point has to be 850 so we sell everything before we go back and give work to, to yes. him Jamdanis we do from 10 to 20 pieces okay uh, then uh, the jacquards we do around 60 pieces so right. every also every region uh, the weavers have there because it's a bit technical over here there's a drum there's a huge drum uh, where they wrap the warp threads in order to make the warp so the circumference of, of, of the drum also dictates the amount of saris that needs to be put on the wall. Mm. So every region kind of, it varies a little bit. So you have to work accordingly uh, yeah. to that particular, uh, yeah. So when you say you do 100 pieces, do they come out in the same color? Uh, so you will have, is that how it is? Your yeah, say for instance, same? there is a warp and a wave. So the warp yeah. color says black. Okay. Uh, in on a black, I can short red, blue, yellow, green, all these colors. Okay. So I can short the wave color. Okay. Differently, but the warp black okay. is going to be the same. Right. So that's how it's. Although it's a different color, but it's all shades of 
I'm when a color mixes with black, whatever comes out, that shade comes out. But right. ultimately, to the eye, it looks a bit different. But the warp of hundred black is still. If, if I want to do say a red warp, I can't. So yeah. I have to wait for that hundred. To, uh, I mean, pieces to come up and then put another two uh, hundred for the for the red. Right. Okay. Understood. Very interesting. Your designs. I want to see. Uh, you know, people selling you know copies of your designs this is a bailu which is not from you but called a bailu bailu has become a generic term uh, how do you yeah. now with uh, you know competition like that does that impact you does that affect you uh, how do you deal with competition like that see i don't know how it has imp- affected us uh, financially i don't think it has really impacted uh, that much i don't know if, if we were not copied what to would have happened mm. but uh, emotionally yes initially i used to feel very very down when i would see uh, my copies I, all the people would keep telling me you know take it as a compliment but it was difficult for me as a designer and a creator to absorb it and you know okay. say it's okay but over the time i've seen uh, i think it, that fear that uh, thing was also from a fear of insecurity because i would feel that oh my god we would lose out our market because it would get flooded over the market but what happened over the years more we got copied more people started finding us out i think the fact that bailu has become a generic term is because we got copied so much and i realized it it uh, over the time is that when weavers would uh, weave my kind of sarees and take it to the market and sell they they had a better opportunity of selling because it was something new and man they were selling it more so now i see it as uh, uh, like a like something which i have given it back to the community mm. like this this generic style of weaving which is not a traditional style of weaving this um, mixing of yarn the sequins and that entire look i mean by look is a particular look it's not about just that particular design it's about yeah. that look of when you wear it you look different than the, than the other traditional sarees so i think to be able to create that look i think is a huge achievement in a lifetime because i don't think people really get to see their own creation being turned into a generic term like we get a lot of phone calls where people call up and say do you sell bailu sarees mm-hmm. so so we say of course we are bailu <laughs> So they don't understand because they think Bailu is a kind of a size. So yes. it's a huge compliment, actually, to see. And I believe because we were copied so much by every weaver. I think Bengal handloom now uh, identifies itself with this particular weave. And any exhibition you go, there'll be at least a couple of stalls who will be would be selling uh, our kind of sari, and they say it's a Bailu sari or a Bailum sari, and. Uh, so i think we wouldn't have been able to market ourselves so well to turn it into a generic term hadn't the entire community taken it up as their own so there now i feel the uh, i i feel nice when not nice i would say but i feel uh, that i've contributed to that community because i have also you know engaged with them over so many years and we have built our entire success or business on their skills i mean i don't sit and weave every sari they do it first us so it's something that we have given we have given it back so the community apart from the people who work for me the others they can also take it up and they also have a good market so the i think there in i feel i've contributed in sustenance i yeah. think that we have managed and i really feel good about it that we have at least achieved that dream that Uh, from where we started is to be able to sustain livelihood with the skills so that the skills would be passed on to the next generation and it would live i think that is a dream both of us we had and i think we feel happy that we have managed to kind of i mean make it so do you work only with looms in uh, bengal or do you also work outside like odisha or you know any nearby uh, eastern region or anywhere in india mostly mostly we work in bengal we work now at least in eight to uh, eight different uh, zones in uh, bengal which has different uh, skill levels and yeah. uh, different aesthetics uh, i tried working in 
in in Orissa, in Andhra. But somehow I feel I always get more inspired with the when I work in Bengal. Somehow I, I I think Bengal has to offer so much, and it has so much of stories, and it has so much of ingrained aesthetics in the villages still. Uh, that even the pretty when I look at a traditional sari, which when I see that, when I understand the sensibility, it kind of talks to me. Bengal weaves, I think, some of, probably because I'm here. I'm I have seen my mom, my grandmother wearing all these saris over the years, and I've grown up with it. So I, I although I appreciate all the others, and I love uh, the Andhra ikat and Orissa ikat, and I love all the uh, other weaving traditions. I also worked a little bit mega in my Ishwar. And I somehow always find a similarity. Uh, like Maheshwari designs and the old Shantipuri borders are so similar. They're almost exact, you know. And so that so it's always enriching for me and uh, lovely for me to see that whole transition of, of and the travel of the design I mean sensibilities that happen from one place to the other. Yeah. But uh, if you ask me honestly, uh, I still feel very committed to the weavers in Bengal. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, in your journey so far, uh, what would you say were you? You talked about one defining moment, which is the Delhi Crafts Council. But after that, what would you say were your most defining moments in your journey, and what were moments you could pick as? You know where you move to the next growth trajectory in your in your journey. Would would you pick some moments like that and tell us? I think the first moment was when I ran away from my house. I think if I didn't do it, <laughs> it wouldn't have happened. I would still be in the tea garden. God knows what I would be doing. So I think that was really a turning point because my entire focus kind of changed and uh, the way I looked at life. Uh, I I came from a very very cushioned background and but when I actually walked and saw the craftsman I think that attraction the uh, that uh, uh, I, I can't really explain what I felt but then it was uh, it it uh, it was a huge impact and it really turned my life and it really turned the way I look at life and um, uh, so that I think it was one of a really a turning point number one number two i think was uh, when i freshly passed out from nift i had as a student you have these all romantic ideas about what you want to do and all of that but when i went to philadelphia to do my studies in printing although it was just a small three months workshop very intense but i mean workshop course in philadelphia there's a place called Fabric Workshop and Museum where a lot of textile artists, they come and work. They do their textile art over there. And uh, what Fabric Workshop Museum does is it hires uh, uh, apprentices like us, like fresh graduates. They hire us they, and they train us with printing and all of that. But at the same time, uh, they also make us work with the textile artists who do their artwork in fabric. When I was a French graduate out from NIFT and I designed, you see textiles as a textile. But when I went over there and I started working with various textile artists, like we have worked with cobwebs, we have worked with uh, various things, you know, where it's not a, not a conventional yarn. You know, when, when we think about a cloth, we think it's a conventional yarn of a cotton or a silk or a polyester or zari. But there I got to work with textile artists who were working with fibers which were not uh, conventionally textile, uh, I mean fibers, you know. So that entirely broke my whole uh, vision of how I look at textiles. And so when, and I think it's over there where that, those three to four months that I was there and I was working with them, I started thinking, oh my God, you know, in India, we have this immense treasure, but we have never looked it from the other side. We have only looked it as a traditional uh, textile. And whoever works with them, works with them from the traditional angle. But no one really thinks that, oh my God, this can be changed into something completely different. And if you really see in my, the work, what, which I came back and did is exactly that. I saw it, I saw a traditional textile, I still can see a traditional 
skill and I know how I can change it and make it contemporary. Not losing the essence. I think that is very, very important. When you're contemporizing, sometimes you can really go wrong and lose the essence. But yeah. what I managed to do is I managed to make keep the balance of keeping that essence intact. Like say for instance, the sari you're wearing is a modern contemporary sari, but it has that ethnic essence still intact in it. Yeah. It is still, you can feel it is hand woven, it is done by a person, it has its roots in its tradition, but at the same time, it's not traditional. So I think this aspect of me being able to deconstruct uh, the, tra the traditional <laughs> look of, uh, of handlooms is because of that training. So that I really consider to be another huge turning point. I, th I don't think Bailu Saris would have been Bailu Saris today. I hadn't been there and that training, I didn't get that training. I think uh, the third turning point is definitely meeting Rumi. I don't think if I met Rumi, I would have got come into business because I'm not, a, not although I'm from a business family and she is not, but she is more the business person than me. I don't understand business. I don't say I won't understand, but I don't like getting into it. I like getting absorbed in the technical and the working and the production. That is the beauty of her. She understands the business part and she's also a creative design person. So she knows how to merge it. I mean, today, I think if we were run by a corporate, I don't think we would have been so successful. We would have lost that heart. I think Bailu has a heart and a soul which would be lost in a corporate world because Rumi merged it into a a sense a sensitive uh, business model which understands the finance at the same time which understands uh, the human aspect the quality quality and then i think uh, when we met mala and jeet and bailum when we started uh, bailum and before bailum i think another turning point is the delhi crafts council where because of them, we started doing saris. Otherwise, today, I don't think we would be doing saris. And they kind of believed in our work so much. They kind of pushed us. And particularly this lady called Kamaini Jalan from Delhi Crafts Council. She really kind of believed in our work. And, you know, suddenly you get these people, you meet them, you don't know them, but you meet them. And they kind of believe in you so much that you feel almost inspired. Kamaini is someone like that. And she kind of really pushed me into making sari. She said, last when I said no to her, she said, I'm going to pay money from my pocket and book a stall for you. So if you don't come, I'll lose the money. I'll, I'm still ready to take that risk, but I really feel that you should do sari. So that was her conviction in my work, which I didn't have probably in my own work. So, you know, so definitely Kamayani Jalan and Delica that show in Delhi Crafts Council, we were totally mobbed. Uh, two days and we were mobbed. We came back with four sari. We were exhausted, but we were happy. Mm. That, you know, people accepted our the designs. And for the first time, we were seeing how people were happy, kind of buying them, wearing them. People bought on the first day, came, wore it on the second day, and bought, bought three more. You know, it was like something. Like, I've never seen anything like that in my life. So that was definitely which kind of boosted and pushed us into this whole area of saris, which is now what we are known for. I don't think Bayali would be known for its scarves and dupattas had we had not done saris. Yeah. And then, of course, Bailum. Uh, Bailum establishing that store in brick and mortar. And then I think it expanded more because people started coming in, feeling uh, the ambience, uh, talking to us, buying. Um, so it kind of re-established that whole idea of our way, our, our vision uh, again. So I think all these has been uh, different milestones in my life, which uh, it has been an evolving journey. It is not, every stage was different. It's not that I can say what I'm doing to, today, I would have done it 20 years back. No, I think every stage has been different. Everything has inspired and taken a journey. And I've really gone along with the flow. I've never kind of thought too much about it. I mean, we have never planned much. We have always taken things in our stride. And we have also grown, I mean, like that. Honestly, even in Bailum today, we don't have uh, business meetings where we talk about uh, forecasting 
business for the next five years. We don't because we don't understand that. And I've told my partners, and luckily they also understand our uh, sensibility, and they kind of approve of it. That we we grow organically. I mean, whatever comes, if there's a demand for a particular thing, we grow. If there's no demand for a particular thing, we kind of put it down and I mean move forward. So you know, we have always believed in that going with the flow and moving forward and organically kind of expanding the way we have to. So do you fancy yourself as a fashion designer or a textile designer? Is there a difference between the two? Because I hear both these terms and I'm wondering, is there a difference between the two and what would you say you are? Uh, of course, I think there is a difference. Textile designer, our focus is the textile. So it is the base that we are creating, whether it's weave or print or embroidery. So we are responsible for creating the surface. Whereas the fashion designers, uh, I think their strength point is the cuts, the mm. way the garment is going to fall uh, on your body, the cut, the uh, you know the flare, the comfort of that is something there. Luckily, because I think in India uh, the concept of unstitched garment is still so popular, like sari. It's still such a popular garment and it's totally unstitched. So therein, I could play both that role uh, because I'm not good at, I don't understand garments. I don't understand the cuts and the fall of a garment, but I understand the textile fall of a sari on a body. Mm. I understand that because that is my subject. That is my textile part. So I definitely consider myself to be a textile uh, designer. Another aspect where I feel where we differ is that we as textile designers, we don't follow trends. We follow a textile skill or we follow a particular, uh, say people specialize in print or people specialize in embroidery or people specialize in weaves, maybe weaves from Bengal or weaves from, so, you know, it's more specific. And so you work with a community on a much more longer term. Whereas a fashion uh, designers, every six months they need to change according to the yeah. season. Yeah. So maybe they can't work with a particular group after six months. They have to move on and go somewhere else. Or they always have to be in the trend. I, I don't care whether I'm trendy or not because I'm not in that league of trying to create something trendy. I'm, in a, I'm trying to create classic uh, timeless pieces. Whereas a uh, a fashion designer's job is to be on the trend because the entire segment of customers are also the also different. When you come to me to buy a sari, you're looking for a classic piece or a piece that you will wear over a much longer time. It's not that you're going to wear it for this season, next season you're going to not wear the sari. But when you go to buy a garment, you will probably think, okay, now it's summer. 2020 what is in trend and what am I supposed to wear so even as a customer I think your mindset changes when you go to a fashion designer or when you come to the textile uh, designer so I'm 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 definitely textile because I understand that okay so tell me COVID times uh, and the uncertainties for the last five months and you know uncertain future as well how do businesses like yours, uh, which support so many looms and has an online and offline, you know, an offline retail presence, how do you cope in in a circumstance uh, circumstances like this? I think COVID has really it's uh, something which has really changed the entire scenario, and, and nothing what you have experienced earlier or your experience cannot be applied to COVID time because it's completely uh, different. We are also learning anybody. I sometimes, you know, see these webinars of people trying to say what is beyond language and it's all rubbish because you, if none of us, I think, know what is in store for us and how everything will change and society will change and how we are going to react. But what I can tell you is what is going on currently is that definitely has affected a uh, big time. And I think especially in India, because uh, of the lockdowns, of a such lengthy lockdowns and so much of um, job losses and salary cuts and all of that that has happened all over the country, the basic economy on which I think India was standing up 
so long, being so strong economy because of its huge population. And there was a time in between where everybody was earning enough uh, to kind of maintain a certain standard of living and also indulge in, you know, their um, the excess what they had in indulging into things what they like. So all businesses were doing well and thriving because there was something in it. Uh, everybody had a slice of the pie. But COVID time really changed everything. The Indian economy, I think, has really slumped uh, because of the job losses and, and everything and prolonged lockdowns. Uh, and what has affected is more than the financial aspect, I'm, I'm now thinking about the psyche of a woman. I mean, we are a predominantly sari weaving uh, brand. We are known for our saris. So, say for instance, for a woman who is wearing a sari, now if, now that whole culture of wearing sari on an everyday basis has gone. Mm -hmm. Sari has become. We have to accept sari has become an occasion wear. Now earlier pre-COVID, we had a lot of uh, occasions. We would go. Or we would get invited to people's houses or dinners or lunches or I mean innumerable amount of. And or, or rather, we would create a lot of occasions where we could wear saris. Yeah. But now everything is stopped. So would a woman wear a sari in the house? No. I was talking. I'm talking to my uh, uh, some of my clients, close close clients whom I know, who are teachers and professors who wear sari on an everyday basis because of their profession. So even they told me that uh, that Bapa next, even if the colleges open up and the university schools open up, I'm scared to wear a sari because every day if I wear a sari, I need to come back home and wash it. Yes. Now, sari you don't wash every day. And handloom saris are not good in the washing machine also. It needs to be hand washed. Now, how, in the COVID time, a lot of people have, you know, you are not allowing your help to come and help you in the house. You're doing everything. You are now on top of that. You're cooking, mopping, cleaning, and then you're washing saris every day. It's a bit too much for me to expect yeah. them to wear. So you know, sari wearing itself, I think, COVID time will take a back seat. So there, I don't know how uh, that that will definitely affect the market for for sure. What we are trying to do right now with our we was there, we are trying to tell them okay if you are not giving saris okay let us we have yardages so at least you know I can we can make garments and offer people simple garments and we can make some small amount of saris. It's not that sari wearing will completely die out or anything but that the demand will definitely be 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 affected logically if I am thinking logically if suddenly tomorrow everybody decides to, I mean, not care about anything, wear a sari and come out, fantastic for us. Yeah. But logically, if you feel here, yeah. so we, I'm also trying to work with them and, you know, trying to tell them, okay, let's do this, let's do that. Because even I'm groping in the dark, honestly mm. speaking. No one, I think no expert can really predict what is going to the future. I'm more worried about the livelihood. Yeah. Because that's a commitment which we have stood for 20 years. And it was so beautiful that they told me, you know, we have worked with you for so many years, for 20 years, and we have enough reserve, we have kind of saved enough for ourselves to, to ride over this tide. And don't don't worry that way. Focus on your designs. If you want to do something, create something, let's 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 do it. It's a time when we can actually do more experiments. During production time, probably we couldn't do as much, but but now let us. You know, just keep experimenting and coming up out with new things. So it was such a beautiful uh, way. They kind of consoled me and they kind of, I was very depressed in the, in the middle. But when I went and actually sat with them and talked to them, they kind of inspired me. And they told me that, okay, it's something which is there, which has come, which will go away. But we will, I mean, fight it out together. And I think that uh, I felt that, you know, my job, my whole journey of why I started probably has come to a full circle with this, where, you know, I, it's, it's not, they are, they are no more just dependent on me. They are individual entrepreneurs. They stand their own feet and they're able to, you know, take that decision on their own. They are, they are no more reaching out their hands uh, that please help me. So I really felt good and satisfied. And so now what I'm doing is I'm, 
trying out various experiments uh, with them, trying to work here and there. And they themselves have said that, you know, we can reduce a little amount of looms. It's not that we have to run like 1,200 looms now. Let us, I mean, reduce. So I've given it on them. I mean, they say, for instance, if a person has five hand looms in their house, which he used to run. So he's saying, okay, you give me work for three. You know, I, I can, that, that I can manage for my family. So that's how we are kind of coping up and balancing it out and hoping it's going to uh, get away fast and we can resume our old way of work. Yeah, it's good karma which you've done in the past which is coming your way, uh, you know, back and repaying you, which is always, which is always a great story. So tell me, um, do you have plans, uh, visions for Bailoom outside uh, Kolkata at all? Um, you know, let's assume a real new normal post-COVID. Do you have any such uh, ambitions? Will we see Bailoom outside Kolkata? I, I am asked this question every time I go for any of my exhibitions. Anyway, this is why when are you opening Bailoom in Delhi Delhi's or Bangalore? Yeah. Or, you know? But uh, I honestly feel what me, Rumi, and both our partners in Bailum we really enjoy is that we have been able to create Bailum as a destination store. The people from when they travel all over the world, when they come to Calcutta, they, the one stop that they uh, know they want to come if they love handlooms and textiles, they come to Bailum. So that is something which we enjoy. And I really feel we are not very traditional typical corporate structure. We are, uh, as I said, we have grown on a very free-flowing manner. So I enjoy even when I create one of my experiments and I'm able to put it on, on Bailoom shelf and it gets sold and I get a feedback, oh my God, it was so lovely. And maybe the next piece is never made. I, I enjoy that. Uh, but the moment you are having 10 stores, you have to have 10 same things all over. And I don't want to fall into that uh, structure because I think the moment you fall into that, then your entire creativity goes because then you're always thinking in terms of numbers. Yeah. You're not thinking in terms of what you can create because sometimes some things are quite, um, uh, what to say, quite uh, something which cannot be produced much. Maybe one or two pieces or three pieces, and after that, the uh, weaver said, "Oh my God, it's too tough. I I don't want to go, 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 go. I mean, continue with it." I said, "Okay, fine. Let's change." Because for me, let's like say for instance, I I'm probably diverting a little bit from the main thing, but I want to really explain is that say for instance, people tell me, "Oh my God, earlier days," and I really resent to it because all these you know, textile conferences that I go, I've stopped going to conferences now. I've uh, earlier has to go all they would talk from india is what india used to do 500 years back you know how beautiful the muslins were how soft and it will pass through a ring and all that and how we cannot do that anymore mm. what i try to tell, tell everybody you know appreciate and enjoy what you have you might not have this the west have lost all of this so they don't talk about what they had a thousand years back because we have because we still have people who can create cloth with their own hands we are still comparing so they never get appreciated for the work they're doing right now and that's what that's not a problem why we feel the second generation doesn't want to come into hand looms it's because there's no pride in it because we are always telling them oh you can't create that muslin which is to pass through the ring <laughs> so sometimes I, I people, people told me why can't you do those try and do, I mean I mean recreate those. I said why should I you know why should they lose their eyesight I I know people when they used to weave that 800 pounds fine ma, ma, I mean ma, I mean muslin yeah, it was so fine that they could only weave for a few hours in the day and not more than that and then you know they would lose their eyesight so why should they go through it just because we have this. I mean, I mean, romantic idea about uh, what we had earlier and what we don't have right now. Uh, I know the moment it becomes 10 stores, that flexibility will not be there. I won't enjoy my work. And till I think even right now I enjoy because I can sit and design and I have my fingers in every product that is being made. But the moment it goes beyond that, uh, the moment it, it's just about numbers and how many saris I'm selling and what's my turnover, then I don't think I'll be in this trade at all because I won't enjoy creating any, any anymore. 
And you anyway have collaborations like with Vaya, etc., so that you're present in other cities uh, through some other form. Yeah. So that kind of helps. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I I enjoy that you know over the years what has happened the brand has become so strong in itself and because Bailu has become a generic term now whoever sells our sarees original ones they actually proudly say this is an original Bailu so you know that adds to the <laughs> you know, selling uh, yes. uh, thing rather than initially they would take off our tags I've seen a lot initially when we started sometimes sarees would come back from a certain store there was no tag of us. We would realize that. So now, what happens is the other way. Sometimes we forget to put our tag. We get a photo. Oh, certain sizes we didn't have a tag. Can we get some of the tags? So we send the tag. Yes, I think you've become the standard of quality that people would like to display in their stores. And you know, probably it's like you know they say in a mall you have a headline store which pulls people in. Then they go around buying other stuff. So you've become that uh, crowd puller. Maybe. 